Don't Look Under the Bed is the 1999 Disney Channel original movie about the boogeyman. And believe me when I tell you the children were not ready for this spooktastic fantasy adventure. It pushed all of us to our mental limit by teaching younger children that there was a monster who lived under their bed and older children that even your little brother will die one day, maybe from leukemia. It's not hard to see why Disney got complaints as soon as this movie premiered, forcing it off the airwaves for years until the streaming age began. So join me as we dive into some deadly pranks, terrifying monsters, and alarming mood swings in another installment of Clip Breakdown, baby. Hello television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another Clip Breakdown. This is the playlist where we dive into our favorite movies and TV shows and other media to dissect it. Like when you're in science class and you stab that frog with the pencil dozens and dozens of times. I skip science a lot. Today we're diving into one of my favorite Disney Channel original movies and one of the more rare entries. But before we get into it, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up if you wanna see even more Clip Breakdowns just like this. I'll leave the playlist link below. But most importantly, don't forget to click that subscribe button right down here if you're new and you want to see more movie reviews and commentary like this. I upload two new videos every week, so turn on notifications. You'll always be the knowiest one. Also, real quick, you might notice that I'm wearing this all over aloe plant print shirt from my merch store. This is the phone. You can check out that stuff in the links below as well. I remember very clearly when this movie came out in 1999 because I was living for like the entry level horror movie type of thing. So this movie definitely appealed to my young gay soul and it has lots of drama in theater. Like I said, this movie did not do well when it first premiered. A lot of parents said that it was too dark and the subject matter was too scary for their young viewers to watch. So Disney basically pulled it from the airwaves and never showed it again. Although now it's available on Disney Plus and Amazon. The story begins as most Disney movies do with a young 14 year old girl with just an average everyday name. My name is Frances Bacon McCall. Osland. I'm 14 years old. I'm sorry, what in the Waffle House is your middle name there, Francis? Francis Bacon, everybody. Welcome her to the room. You know, I would be more mad if once we meet the parents, they weren't like also kind of weird and funky, but they are. I love the parents in this movie. They add a lot of color to the story, and I think it's really well acted. Played by Robin Riker and Steven Kobolowski, who I remember from Glee. Anyway, her name is Francis Bacon, but we find out later that her mom is a cultural anthropologist. It adds some character when the character has an interesting name if you bother to explain it. Otherwise it feels like Disney is just looking me straight in the face and being like, this girl's name is Pasta. And it's very hard to take seriously. The whole family wakes up and it's dark outside and everyone's really tired, but we start to meet the whole family. Frances, who's our main character, she has two brothers, one who's older than her, one who's younger. The older one, I wouldn't want him in my house. No one's blaming you, Frances. I'm the one they always blame for everything. That's because you have so much pent up aggression. I do oh, not! I Imagine having to share a home with a teenage boy who is capable of going nuclear at 7 a.m. I cannot. And I was there. I was a pubescent teenage boy once. It was like the gay version of that. So I was like, how dare you drink my Eggo waffle smoothie blenders? I'm gonna send out an apology to my sisters and my mother. I promise to bring you just a toned down version of that this Christmas. Anyway, after some investigation, we find out that this is why things are a little early feeling this morning. Now we are simply trying to determine what has happened to the eggs? It's 4.23 a.m. The clocks say 7.23. The clocks are wrong. The end of the world. I don't know why even the end of the world would justify putting a garbage bag on the table where someone's eating. That's awful. But moreover, it's a big mystery, but as Francis is wondering, we see outside that there's some guy with the scariest toenails and already I'm like, nope, this is too scary for kids. If I was young and I saw like there was some long toenailed man creating mischief outside my window while I slept, I would think about that for weeks. So we just know that he's using dog bones on a string in some way until the next morning. In this clip on their way to school, we learn a little bit more about Francis. It's kind of a cheap out, I think, to use this really haphazard narration, but hey, I'll take it because I love the movie. Most kids my age go to middle school, but I skipped a grade. Did I tell you that our alarm clocks went up three hours early this morning? Our clocks did the exact same thing. They were all three hours early. It's so weird. Well, it's only weird because you don't have a logical explanation for it. This is just the first instance of Francis having the biggest heart on for logic. As she said, she jumped ahead of grade, so she's 14, but she's in high school 
school early. Fun fact, the actress named Erin Chambers played a 14 year old in this movie. In real life, she was actually 20 years old at the time of filming. So quite a jump there. Also, I remember this friend of hers was one of the movie explorer type people. I forget what they were called, but Disney Channel had like a behind the scenes movie crew and Rudy was one of them. And in my young mind at the time as a Disney Channel viewer, it just fits so fully and perfectly into my worldview. I was like, yes, the behind the scenes girl is also the best friend. Um, why is that dog on the roof? <laughs> Now that's weird. Somehow putting a dog bone on a string equates to getting all of the dogs in your city up on the roof. It's a little weird. On their way into school, Frances is sure that she sees some guy who she's not familiar with watching from afar. What is that guy staring at us? What guy? Francis is like, um, the only other black person in this movie. And then while they're in school, the teacher's car gets covered in like an insane amount of eggs. Like all of the world's eggs fall onto this man's car. And if you'll remember this morning, Zoe's mom, no, Francis's mom couldn't find the eggs. So, um, what's that about? What are we doing here? That mysterious teenager who Francis saw actually witnesses the egging happen. So he runs up to the roof and sees all of the empty egg cartons there. So, you know, we don't know what that is, but we hear someone laughing. Meanwhile, back in school, uh, Frances wants everyone to know she's smart. Did your alarm clock go off three hours early this morning? How could you know that? A lot of clocks were wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I've been taking a statistically accurate sampling of the whole school names and addresses and phone numbers, you know, to see if it only happened in one area. Can we take a statistically accurate sampling to see who in this class wants to slap her right now? No one asked you to do extra projects until you get that internship at the water and power department. I don't want to hear it, Missy. Okay, do your geometry. Walking home from school, that guy is still spying on Francis, and we get a little bit more texture from the friendships. I love this. Have you got a crush on Bert? No. Yes, you do. I think it's really brave what he did for your little brother. All he had to do is lie there. But I hear it really hurts when they stick those needles in you. Must be really great to save someone's life. It was the doctors who saved Darwin's life. Now, this is an example of not exposition. You know, it's like that's a realistic way of giving me some interesting story development. It's enough to get me interested and be like, what? I don't know if I have the full story there. And then later, another conversation adds to my understanding. Meanwhile, in Middleburg, which is the name of the town where all this takes place. Strange things were happening that day all over Middleburg. Someone put a little gelatin in a school swimming pool. There was a time in my life right around when this movie came out, so I guess when I was eight years old, where I was heartbroken that I would never experience the joy of jumping into a pool full of jello. My brain had experienced so few cool things at that point in my life that that's the coolest thing I could imagine happening. And I was, was sad, I was depressed. I was like, cause I'll never have that. Who's gonna let me use their pool to fill it with gelatin? How many boxes of gelatin would it require? Now I see YouTubers doing that all the time. So it's actually an attainable goal. I think the parts of my brain that were soft and mushy at the time firmed up like jello enough to be like, that's actually a stupid thing to do, don't bother. In addition to the pool full of jello thing, we have some other lighthearted pranks that actually now that I look at them are more like deadly assaults. I know those teachers don't have the health care for this kind of water damage. Like he might've busted an eardrum. In addition to the pranks, another strange occurrence that seems to be happening around Middleburg is that there's graffiti. Someone is mysteriously writing the letter B all over the place. Like there's this funny sight gag where everyone has the letter B on the bottom of their foot, which already is like, that's crazy. But then the little kid has a lowercase B. E so the pranks are all like cute, tongue in cheek, funny cartoonsville, but still mischievous. The principal is somehow getting the worst of this. He was the one with the egged car. My favorite part of this whole movie is this dog. <laughs> Something about when that golden retriever just falls and then clumsily like gets back up. He's like, oh, today I was in a movie. It gives my whole brain the serotonin I didn't know it needed. There's all sorts of spooky occurrences. Why did I say it? Why did I say it like that? There's all these spooky occurrences happening. Like anything that has a head, all these statues, they turn to look at Frances when she walks by. She's like, I'm used to turning heads, but usually they're not made of marble. <laughs> I don't know why she said that. Maybe she's a 90s stand-up comic. I don't know. No, no, but she is another special type of annoying. 
Why are you always gotta blame me for everything? Ooh, it's called inductive logic? Look, if you want anybody to know you skipped a grade, why don't you just wear a sign? Or you could just keep walking around in that realtor.com outfit you have on and people will think you're all the way in grad school, honey. Like, what is this vest situation? That's how we would dress when we had to like audition for regionals and chorus. All the bisexual kids were like, mm, I think my vest is gonna have pinstripes. Like I said, I really love the parents in this, but at one point, I can't tell if it's a joke or not that the dad is like sort of threatening his son with a knife because the son mouth off to him and he's like, Bert? You know when you sass your sister, we cut off another little piece of your foot and cook it for dinner. Frances has a rough day when it comes to having the fingers pointed at her, starting with her best friend Joe. How could you do this? You promised. This stressed me out when I was a kid. I was like, she would never tell your secret, Joe. Like, why would she do that? Why would she flower this into the garden? Like, what a weird way to tell someone's secret. And also so beautifully done. She should be a horticulturist. But weird stuff is happening all the time. Like this next thing is actually never explained. If I thought it was strange at home, school was even stranger. <laughs> Maybe if we stand still, this 20 year old won't show up here every day. I don't know what the whole freezing time thing happen is. Like, I suppose it's one of the boogeyman's powers that he can stop time, but it's never shown ever again throughout this whole thing. So I really wish they could have given me like one or two more instances of that. So I understand why it's happening. General weirdness at this point. We know this is all boogeyman related because we see this gnarly long fingernail hand. Why is yours the only one without a B on it? Grow up, people. <laughs> We 30 year old high school students need to unite against her. I don't know why if she was doing all these pranks, she would frame herself like that. I just don't understand. Cause wouldn't she be charged with like serious criminal charges? You can't just paint metal without permission. Finally, she sees that gentleman who's been staring at her from across the way and she confronts him. She's like, what are you doing? And he's basically like, you can see me. You're the only one who can see me. I didn't realize. I think I must've been sent here to help you. That's probably why you can see me. Oh, you know, I don't need any help real or Imaginary. There's something very peculiar going down in this burg, Watson, and it looks to me like you're in the middle of it. They said, for the Sherlock Holmes thing, can you do a British accent? And he said, no, I cannot. Basically, Frances makes herself look crazy. Like, do you know who this guy is? And everyone's like, what? That girl with the red hair has uh, schizophrenia. So she's convinced that he's somehow like hypnotized everybody, like group hypnosis. And when she's trying to talk to the principal and the guidance counselor about it, she sees him again and starts chasing him down the hall. When she finally corners him, she asks more questions about why he's here. He's giving out information very slowly, it's like, just say it. I'm tired of the mystery at this point. You ever hear a little voice inside your head telling you you should do something? He told me to come to beautiful downtown Middleburg. Francis? In here, there he is, Larry Houdini. He's right here, he's playing a saxophone, he's moonwalking. I'm just gonna pop back over to my office and grab that pamphlet on the 5150 hold for minors real quick. Be right back. Like, she's seeing some crazy stuff that isn't there. I would be calling someone with a medical degree if this were happening. So they bring in the mom and they try to talk it out and figure out what's going on with her. Starting high school can be traumatic. This is 100% true. My first day at high school was one of the most stressful events of my life. I was like, how are they just gonna throw me into this labyrinthian maze, put my feet in a vice, they're gonna have snakes biting my eyes out. There's gonna be a gym class with all these dudes. It was a nightmare. I understand that her younger brother had leukemia, that he was given bone marrow transplants from his sibling. But Darwin is in remission. The doctors say there's every hope for a complete cure. Me as a kid, what's leukemia? One thing that I guess I really love about this movie is that they don't treat their audience like they're dumb. And I think kids movies never should. There are like Lifetime and Hallmark movies made for real full tax paying adults that don't have all of the different plots and story elements that this one has. I just love the writing. Anyway, the guidance counselor continues to speak out of turn about this thing she knows nothing about. I've been developing a theory. Frances is acting out, ooh, re repressed anger at having to donate her bone marrow to save her brother. Interesting. However, it was our elder son, Albert, who was the donor. Well, it, it was 
Just a theory. See, this is why no private school wants to hire you, Barbara Jean. Parents want crazy theories about their children they can believe in. You think those Montessori, Harvard feeder schools are messing up their kids' diagnosis? They got them on those good mood stabilizers by the time they're 18. This is America, honey. Play ball. Throughout this whole thing, I think the mom is one of my favorite characters. The dad, too. They're just so understanding. They never go right into blindly punishing their daughter just because everyone's pointing their finger at her. They really want to come at it with understanding because they're like, you're acting a little nuts. I'm sure it is all simply a misunderstanding, honey, about repressed anger. Oh, Mom, no. Is there anything oh, your father oh. and I could possibly do? Please. See, Mom just wants to know what's up and if she's being a good parent and if there's anything else they can do for her. I stand the mom. Her hairstyle aged beautifully. Mwah. Keep her. But at the same time as being really understanding, they give us with the parents just enough, like, eccentricity that is believable and funny. Maybe she got involved in some kind of... Oh, I don't know. Mind control. She mentioned being hypnotized in the car on the way home. I don't know why they mentioned that because we never see her mention hypnosis in the car on the way home. Maybe that was a cut scene. Oh, you think that's nitpicky all of a sudden? What do you think this whole thing is? It's nitpicking. Someone said that in the comments. They said, call it nitpicking. And now I just did. Oh, everybody, everybody. You guys, I got two new plants today real quick. This is chamomile. <gasps> And then this one's mint, but it, it's dead. So what to do? Another thing is I'm obsessed with baby bottle pops lately. Like, oh, such a fun treat. Lick the pop, dip it and shake it. And lick it again. Baby bottle pop, baby bottle pop. Thumbs up if you agree. <laughs> there are actually certain points where I'm convinced this writing is too good. And that's the mark of a good kids movie, I think. Like you should be able to get more out of it the more you grow up so that it's fun to rewatch even as an adult. And that's what I experienced with this scene here. Hilarious. You're saying that someone is coming into this house to control our children's minds. How could they do that? So remember, my friend, we are having an important discussion mad. here, Bert. A TV movie admitting that TV is controlling your kid's mind. The director really got one over on Disney here. So I just love that moment there. It was like, <laughs> I can smell my college degree from here. The little brother Darwin, which like, P.S. That was never someone's first name. Darwin was the last name of someone whose first name was Charles. And then it was the name of a monkey on the wild thornberries. You really want to name your kid that, Disney? Come on. You already know that I can't with the kids' names. Darwin. Are you sure there isn't really a boogeyman? Some kids at the park said there is but if you pull the covers over your head at night the boogeyman can't get you you know somebody older and wiser needs to tell those kids the truth it was a big boy who told them about the boogeyman he said his name was larry he said he was playing basketball but I couldn't see him. Oh my God, I didn't realize healthy bone marrow was gonna make you so chatty. Just kidding, it's great to see him so healthy again and talking so much. Larry Houdini does some more wacky stuff. Did I mention that that's his name, Larry Houdini? And this was another moment that really fit well into my brain as a child. This guy played a character named Larry on Even Steven, which was another show going on at the time. Even as a child who didn't know anything, like I was eight years old and I was like, synergy works, go Disney. And that was the day I wrote and invented the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I was inspired by this movie. Also, I don't know what's up with the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You keep it. That can be a whole separate universe. If I could get in a spaceship and fly far away from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, that's where I would go. So noisy. All those laser sounds. Ugh. Frances is like somehow still looking for logic. She's, you know, loves logic. And so she's still under the impression that somehow Larry is a real human being that nobody else can see somehow. I'm like, honey, every time you turn around, he's got a new cop. On. He's Mr. Quick Change over here, and you're believing he's just some kid from the next town over here to bother you? What the hell? They get into the library where she starts looking up some like books on boogeymen, which I guess that's a thing libraries have. Who wants to hear the story about the boogeyman? The boogeyman's a very bad man. If he ever tries to come in your home at night into your room, make sure you pull the covers over here. Great, thanks for alarming these unsupervised toddlers. Appreciate you. You hear that, kids? People come into your room at night to get ya. Have fun enjoying the magic of books. I'm like, what is this movie on? Those Disney Channel execs were like, you know how a lot of kids are kind of afraid of bedtime because they think a monster might be under the bed? Let's validate those fears. That's what Halloween's all about. And it really is. I love Halloween, you guys. What should I be for Halloween? Well, all I have is this pink scarf. So I guess, I don't know, what am I? A doo-wop girl? A pink lady? Tell me more, tell me more. I heard that he trims his pubes. Sorry. Cancel me. The parents continue to show an appropriate level of concern for their daughter. I would do a different kind of solution than them. For me, it's like, if you got a real problem with your kid, that's time to tap out the school guidance counselor. The school guidance counselor is just there to like, let you know something's up. But in a Disney movie, this is what they're there for. She needs professional help. I am going to email that 
guidance counselor. I'm going to invite her over to dinner tomorrow. Oh. She has experience dealing with problems like this. I, I guess a little bit. Gosh, a guidance counselor for your mentally ill child is like inviting a mall cop to a murder scene. How are they gonna help? There's actually a really interesting reveal in this next scene, and I didn't remember this until I watched this movie again. Larry had no idea that Francis was the older sister of Darwin, because, spoiler alert, Larry knows Darwin. Larry used to be Darwin's imaginary best friend. I forget if I told you, but Larry keeps going on and on about how he's an imaginary friend. That's why nobody can see him. Darwin, hey man, don't you recognize me? Darwin, why won't you be my friend anymore? I don't understand why he doesn't believe in me anymore. Well, look, I told him a long time ago that it was childish to believe in things like that. You did it. You're the reason why he can't see me. You told Darwin to stop believing in me. And in the second act of the film, we'll teach children that even your whimsical best friend can turn on you aggressively when you don't please them. This scared me to the bone. Like just now, I was like, oh, he turned on her as soon as he had a few drinks in him, didn't he? I know that's not literally what happened, but that's what my nervous system was telling me. My fight or flight response was triggered in a very domestic abuse type of way. I'm just gonna be real with you guys. I know this is Disney Channel, but I'm just gonna be real. Despite this being a kid's movie, I really love how they go there with this part. Like, we get some actual vulnerability from Francis's character in a way that we don't always get from A, children's movies, and B, child actors. They're not always capable of giving a performance like this. So I'm really glad that Disney went and cast a 20-year-old for this role because she brings it. Oh, he needs to believe in his doctors, okay? That's how you stop being afraid. Face reality. I had to help him do that. You wanted to help him? Then why didn't you give him some of your bone marrow, huh? I wanted to help him, and the doctor said Burr was the only one who could do it. I bet that was a relief. No, I wanted to do it. Yeesh, when can we go back to the pranks? Because there's a lot of talk about blood cancer right now, and I was expecting a Halloween movie. Also, I can't pretend like this girl is not fake crying. She definitely doesn't have any tears on the face, but I didn't say it was the juiciest crying ever, okay? You know how much I love those juicy tears. When I see crying, let me just show you what it's like. I would have donated bone marrow if I could have, but I have O positive blood, okay? I just went there. Tell me more, tell me more. What's your blood type, okay? What happened just now? My brain hurt. Frances has a lot of heat on her right now, and that night, it's about to get way worse. We get our first glimpse at the boogeyman after Larry wakes her up. Okay, Jeepers Creepers, like, that man is too scary for Disney. Are you kidding me? Those sharp teeth are ready to take a chunk of my arteries and swallow them. In no way was that ever gonna be okay for kids. Like, you've got six-year-olds watching this channel, and you're gonna show me that? Dark themes, okay, Disney, even for Halloween. In fact, this was only the second movie Disney Channel ever had to give a TV PG rating. The other movie being Halloween Town. It's nice of you to hang around, but you'd be safer on the ground. And you'll see that you boogie too. Inside of the mirror, it's you. Throughout the whole movie, the boogeyman rhymes, but like the way they're delivered, I just almost barely ever caught their rhymes. But either way, all of those decisions were added later. Earlier concept drawings from the director showed the boogeyman as being really dark and barely visible, and there were like quills coming out of him. But they thought that might be a little too dark, so they decided to go for someone that's like Edwardian and speaks in rhyme so that it felt lighthearted. But then they gave him teeth of a ghost and the dead eyes of Melania Trump and said, that's fine. In her attempt to help Larry down from the roof, things go crazy, and it's bad for Francis. Look around, and you will see that blackout starts with B. So Francis gets framed for shutting off the power in the whole town, except for their house. So obviously it's like the ultimate setup. It looks bad for her. She's like, oh my God. The next day, Larry is trying to build something to fight this. This part of the movie gets a little, it's the middle part. You know what I'm saying? Like the middle of the movie where you're like, boo, it's the middle. Well, so what, you never get old? Our friends grow up. So we go find new friends. Making new friends keeps you young, just like aerobics. Well then why didn't you get a new friend when Darwin stopped believing in you? Because Darwin, still needed me. Can we stop with the angry stepfather outbursts? It's a lot. It's really taken a toll on my trustworthiness as a child. You can't be hurting me and yelling at me every two minutes. I'm a child. I baby watching movie. Larry starts talking about this invention and he gets a little sexist, like real sexist. Well, that's Dan's vacuum cleaner. Your dad does the vacuum in? Yeah, he likes to do the housework. 
This is starting to get unbelievable. Really? If a man lived alone, who's gonna do the vacuuming? They don't always just have a woman around to vacuum for them. In fact, if a man ever tells you that they think vacuuming is for women, you need to run in the other direction because that is a man who does not know how to properly clean his private parts. That's just science. You think I invented science? I just know everything about it because I read all the books. That's my impression of Frances when she skipped a grade. Crazy stuff is happening though, not just with the angry outburst, but also Larry's nails are getting long all of a sudden. Like we've got some boogeyness happening and I just want to know why. But he's getting really defensive about it. He's trying to brush it under the rug. Ugh. Is that a zit? Girl, you need to take care of your skin. Me, when I was giving a Macy's makeup consultation when I was still drunk from the night before, I'd be like, we should give you a cool party look. Can I tell you about this guy I met last night? They would be like, <laughs> you smell like cigarettes. I just wanted a nude lip, but now I've got gay Ozzy Osbourne with his fingers near my mouth. The next night, the guidance counselor has come over for a, I don't know what this whole dinner is for. I guess it's really just to like diagnose Francis over dinner, I guess. And we get this hilarious joke. Like it took me a minute to be like, oh, that's a lovely little bust you have there. Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Do you get the wordplay? Lovely little bust, she was like, what? That's an adult joke, right? Something for the parents, I suppose. Nobody wants to give Frances a break. Every room she enters, there's some crazy stuff happening that's gonna make her look nutso. Larry's cooking. <laughs> Oh, oh, it smells disgusting. I needed some weak old sweat, so I ran one of Bert's gym socks through the blender. He's making some sort of bait, like it's called boogie boo, which is the stuff the boogie man likes to eat to attract him. The mom comes in and gives me even more heart touching <gasps> scenes. I think it is about time we started telling each other the truth, young lady. Now, mom, we don't want to punish you, Francis. Can we move? We just want to understand why you are doing it. I know what we went through with Darwin must have been very hard for you. It, we almost lost him and that was very scary, oh, even for the grown-ups. How much do I love this mother-daughter moment? It's giving me such nice empathy for this character. Like, it's giving me a sense of how much the mom cares. I just believe this relationship and I love every scene they have together. The chemistry is so right. And they still manage to make it funny. She's like, what can we move from this smelly thing? You see how a scene can be multiple multiple things, it can move the story forward while teaching you something about a character, while making you laugh. It's called entertainment, people. There's a formula for it. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the dining room, the dinner with the guidance counselor could be going better. That looks like Bert's gym suck. Wow, Darwin, did you get a set of magical eyes with that bone marrow transplant? How are you seeing that already? You just see a strand of fabric and you know it's your brother's gym sock? Like, you know a little too much. This kid, I'm suspicious of this kid. In general, I feel like dinner scene with the guidance counselor doesn't need to be there. I get that it's like kind of a funny moment, but I don't see really what it does. I would have liked it more maybe if there were some stakes to it, right? Like Francis had to hide this big mess in the kitchen because if the guidance counselor didn't think she was okay, then she would be sent back to eighth grade or something. I don't know. Grill me some steaks. Darwin, on his way out, steps in some of that boogie goo, and that's not good. Now watch. No, 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 no. That's too scary, okay? Everybody of all ages is afraid of putting their feet over the bed and having something grab it, okay? Showing that to a child in a kid's movie is irresponsible. How am I ever gonna sleep again? That's what I wanna know. The purple lights in the fog machine, that's fine. Every kid is doing that now thanks to TikTok. That's like cool. Grabbing my ankle in the dark, no thank you. I don't know what I would do if I ever had like a scary experience in my house. Like I don't wanna live in a place with that kind of negative energy. That's why I refuse to do my taxes. It's just like harsh vibe, you know? Francis and Larry realize that they've got to go and get Darwin. Of course, Larry doesn't want Francis to come. He's like, you stay in the real world, girl. And she's like, I need to be able to help. I couldn't help him when he was sick. And I love this. They're like really giving us the complexity. They're bringing in her emotion. She's been kind of standoffish about talking about this illness the whole time. And we finally get her perspective on it, which is just perfectly timed, I think. What you said about me being relieved when I couldn't be a donor, it's true. I was glad I had to be Bert because I was scared. And this also sets up for us kind of the theme of the whole movie, which is facing your fears and about whether it's childlike to be afraid. So they really narrate that message for us. She comes to A, become a stronger person because of that lesson. And she finds success through that growth. And that sounded like nonsense, but I swear I had thoughts in my brain while I said it. So that's all it's gonna have to do. Meanwhile, the dad continues to kill me. He's so funny. And I love that she's so honest. A lot of Disney movies will be all about hiding something from your parents. And it is fun that this movie 
basically is like, they don't even have to do that. Did you put a gym sock in the blender? I am not leaving here until I hear the truth. It was the boogeyman. Okay, the boogeyman. You know, and he's got Darwin under the bed right now, and he has been the cause of everything that has been happening around here. Maybe you would be more comfortable speaking with your mother about this. Too good, and it's like, it fits in perfectly with the tone of this movie's humor, where it's like kind of wacky, zany humor. We have these crazy shadows and cartoonish lighting going on. The music is very mischievous and fun. Even serious topics and conversations and moments where it feels like very perilous, like your brother's kidnapped. They still have time for jokes, so it feels appropriately lighthearted to me now, although as a kid, the scary scenes probably are too much. Francis goes against what Larry says, and of course, climbs under the bed into Boogie World, which I love. When they meet up there, you see that everything is like big. It's as though the land is made up of things that were lost under the bed, which I think is just a great concept. I loved the borrowers as a kid because I love big props. If you can give me a big golf ball, I'm good for life. Larry, by the way, is full of good reads on Francis. He's great. I bet you on your educational toys. The way Francis talks about logic in this movie, I fully believe that. She was five years old being like, Abacus, I love it. What I love is this cute little sequence where they race through Boogie World. Let's take a look. fun to watch. It really made us feel initiated into Boogie World. It wasn't like, oh, they climbed under the bed and here we are. It brought us deeper into the world. It gave us this look at the architecture around whatever. But it was also like a perfect marriage of CGI, green screen. They used the practical effects with the stunt performer being pulled off and the sparks flying up when she hit that bend. It worked great with the music. It was just everything. I loved it. And it wasn't too long also. A lot of movies, things can be too long or too short. This movie felt really well paced so that it didn't feel like it lasted forever. You would be amazing at how long a 90 minute film can feel when you're taking notes on it and it sucks. Thankfully, Darwin is nearby, so they are accomplishing their mission pretty quickly. It's convenient, but hey. Francis! Darwin! It smells like a dirty sock in here. Jeez, Darwin, you sure seem to know a lot about socks and feet and feet sweat. Do I detect an early foot fetishist? This kid's gonna be a total locker room pig when he grows up. I can see it from here. Is that okay to say in the public of the world? <laughs> boogie world said it. It wasn't me, it was the boogie man. <laughs> Francis goes to start helping Stevie. I don't know whose names those were, but whatever. Darwin, the boogeyman comes up. It's scary. This boogeyman needs to chill. Nope, mm -mm. too much when he glides like that and he's caressing his face. He really does look like the guy from Jeepers Creepers, the Jeepers Creepers monster, I guess, the creeper. Love Jeepers Creepers, even though, ugh, even though the director of that movie is a convicted child, I can't say the word, Hollywood. <laughs> That's where I live. Larry is stuck by the extension cord, but he still manages to help by like bowling over the guy. They're fighting. Oh, right when they think they have the boogeyman under control, crap. Larry has made the full transformation to boogeyman because I don't know if it was clear, but he became a boogeyman as soon as Darwin stopped believing in him. So it really is kind of Francis's fault this whole thing's happening. Guys, not good for her. Sucks to be a ninth grader, right? Larry! Come, let's play, Francis. Franny, Franny, Franny. Franny? Scaring me with these people jumping around with their long fingernails. Someone's gonna scratch my cornea. I should probably mention just cause I feel like it's come up several times. I'm afraid of having my cornea get scratched. I don't know what it means or what it would feel like. That's why I don't like the idea of it. If you've ever had a scratched cornea, I would love for you to let me know in the comments below how you made it through. Did you survive? It's straight up horror movie time when the Grinch or whatever is pulling the kid towards the ledge. For help, quick! Remember your friend Larry? He's not real. You told me. Scary to take such a long, long drop. Francis realizes the only way out of this is for Larry to come back to normal, which will take Darwin believing in him. It's sort of a Peter Pan moment, which they teased at the library. Hey Darwin, can you still believe in Larry? Clap your hands, okay? That's all you have. Ew, that 1999 CGI was so cringy. It was like Sega Genesis. And when he crumbled, he was like three feet shorter somehow. Okay, whatever. I remember this moment being freaky. 
You just almost impaled that little Harry Potter looking boy. Wingardium Levy Nosa. Using her logical brain and her like, I skipped a grade smarts, Francis manages to get the thing plugged into a battery so that they can plug in the centrifuge or whatever to the monster. I'm getting old. I'm getting so old, I've even forgotten how to rhyme anymore. I love this old lady. Her hair looks fierce. They were like, we're gonna give you the volume you always wanted. And she was like, it looks like cotton candy. But for some reason that they don't really explain, this doesn't actually work. Your attempt of you. It didn't work. When I first saw the movie, I was like, why did they do that? Well, like this whole centrifuge thing was such a big part of the plot and it didn't even work. But reading into the trivia and the behind the scenes of the movie, it made sense. The director had a realization. One of the things they teach you in like screenwriting courses is the solution to the hero's problem has to come from within. So the centrifuge just working and killing the zombie or whatever, killing the boogeyman, it's too simple. It's like an external force did it. It had nothing to do with Francis. So instead he rewrote it and found a way to make this feel a little more like it was the hero's journey that brought the success. You can't scare me. Really? Ah! 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 Zoe! Zoe? Only one person ever called me Franny. I'm sorry, Zoe. No! The boogeyman's a girl? Get out of here! Larry, we've had enough of your sexist thing. Like, only women can vacuum and only men can be boogeymen. Like, where are you getting these rules from? Like, what are even the mechanics of a imaginary friend? Like, how is Zoe, the imaginary friend, the only one who ever called Francis Franny? That came from your own head, girl. You're calling yourself Franny in your mind. Like, this had me all sorts of confused growing up. I was like, am I supposed to be having an imaginary friend who just walks up and like tells me stuff, like gives me new information? So I thought I was imagining it. Anyway, Larry, your comments age poor. A boogeyman can be any gender, and you should shut up. This next clip is like the only thing that stuck in my mind from watching the movie way back when I was eight. I don't know why. You okay, Darwin? I got sock fudge in my mouth. And that's a wrap on Darwin, everybody. Please put more cotton back in his mouth before he says more stuff about his cancer. We can't take it. Meanwhile, things start wrapping up nicely here around Middleburg. We came upstairs to apologize. Your father just logged on to the internet news. The same things that were going on here just started happening last night in Centerville. When I log on to the internet news, it says that the world is ending and everything sucks. So what's the story on the boogeyman here? Actually... It's boogie person. I'm British and I work at the circus or something. Like, come on, Francis. Even your imaginary friend is weird as hell. There's another little scene outside. Like, there's probably three too many wrap-up scenes for this movie because I keep thinking, like, they could end it here. They could end it here. They surely are going to end it here. But it is touching how Francis doesn't want to lose these new friends that she has. I believe in both of you. The time to believe is when you're little like Darwin. When you still need us. I don't want to lose you again. What's up, friend? We know you're too grown up to have an imaginary friend. Well, no. I mean, I can see you guys right now, and that proves logically that- How are you going to talk to me about logic when you were just in an under-the-bed realm where a man with long fingernails attacked you from inside a huge book? Like, we're done with logic, okay? You were caught in some little fishing net for more than two minutes because someone was holding it. That didn't make sense either. Where's the logic there? What's not clicking? What's not clicking? Now, this very next part actually had some other interesting backstory behind it. For whatever reason, this is how Larry decides to convince Francis to let go. Uh, did you just sexually awaken that child to make her stop talking? Cause that, there's something in there that's not right. When the movie was written, it wasn't scripted that Larry was black. So when they cast Ty Hodges, Disney approached the director and was like, so what do we want to do about that scene? Should we cut it? Cause they were thinking that in America, some of their Southern affiliates would have a problem with an interracial kiss on a children's show. Thank goodness the director, Kenneth Johnson, talked them into keeping the scene as is, saying that it would be important. And I agree. I think it was important to show that. I didn't realize it had that sort of cultural significance maybe because it's a weird plot element like did that kiss really need to happen i guess it was funny like you won't worry about imaginary friends anymore because now your pussy's throbbing oh great one more scene and guess who's in it our favorite little brother darwin francis uh -huh. i'm not really scared of the boogie 
I'm worried about getting sick again. Okay, darling. Jeez, well, today we learned that leukemia is imaginary or something. Blah, blah, blah. Go to bed. Oh, huh, what a fun family adventure and a great way to get into the Halloween spirit for me here at the start of October. What other spooky content should we look at next? Let me know in the comments below. Also, give this video a big thumbs up if you want to see even more clip breakdowns on DCOM movies. What did you think of what Don't Look Under the Bed? Good? Bad? Too scary for television? And if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right down here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week, so make sure you turn on the notification bell and you'll always be in the know like a pink lady. Don't forget to check out merch like this in the description below as well. You guys are all the greatest. Thank you so much for don't looking under the bed with me today. I will see you next time. Ugh.